So, Dr. Olmeda is an associate professor at El Colegio de México in Mexico City. He holds a master's and a PhD in political science from Northwestern University in the U.S. He also holds a master's in ethics, politics, and public policy from the University of Essex in the U.K. His research agenda is focused on issues related to subnational politics and comparative federalism in Latin America. He's also been the editor-in-chief of the academic journal Foro Internacional since 2017. Dr. Olmeda, please. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I am very pleased to be here and share uh, this panel with, with, with you. And I hope to learn a lot uh, from other uh, experiences. I'm going to talk uh, briefly about Mexico. Uh, as, as you know, Mexico is a, is a federal country with uh, 32 states. And uh, it's um, even if it's a federal country, it's still very centralized. So I think it's important to have that in mind to understand the response to the crisis. Uh, first, I, I want to um, share with you some basic data about the effects uh, of the pandemic uh, in the country. Uh, Mexico has uh, nowadays uh, more or less 80,000 deaths and 800,000 cases, uh, that, uh, the number of deaths uh, per million, it's uh, more or less uh, similar to the ones uh, observed in the US and Brazil. But if we consider uh, the uh, case uh, fatality rate is uh, much higher than in the US and Brazil. Um, hopefully the number of cases, uh, new cases and, and new deaths uh, are declining uh, as uh, the Undersecretary of Health uh, announced uh, yesterday. So um, maybe this trend uh, it's uh, changing, but uh, the, 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 the bad thing is that uh, winter is coming. So uh, the situation or, or the second wave uh, will be ahead. Um, the second point is that uh, the pandemic uh, has also a very important negative effect, uh, effect in terms of the economy. Uh, the GDP dropped 17% uh, in the second quarter of 2020, and this decline is uh, worse than uh, the decline observed in the two previous economic crises in the country in 2009 and uh, uh, 1994. So the situation is, is, is complicated, and uh, as, as uh, you probably know, uh, Mexico is, is a very unequal country and uh, inequalities uh, probably will, um, will increase uh, in, in, the, in the following uh, years. Uh, according to, the, to, to the, the governmental body in charge of uh, measuring poverty, we expect to have two, uh, sorry, uh, 10 million uh, new poors uh, in, in the in the in the next uh, year. So let me move uh, to to give you some general idea about the the, the response that the country um, that the, the country uh, gave to to the crisis. Um, one important point to mention is that according to the constitution. Uh, when some this this kind of emergencies um, uh, emerge, uh, uh, a, a, a particular body should be called uh, in order to uh, give the, the measures that the country should uh, follow. And this is the National Public Health uh, Council that convened uh, at the end of March and uh, is uh, was the body uh, in charge of. Uh, in a sense, um, designing the, the general strategy to, to deal with the, with the pandemic. And as a result of that, uh, we had uh, this national campaign of healthy distancing that was uh, declared uh, in March 23rd. And as a result of that, uh, education activities were suspended, uh, some recommendations about how to deal with uh, vulnerable employees uh, were also issues uh, issued and um, mainly, I mean, the general uh, idea was that uh, the population should stay at home. Um, uh, one important point is that since the beginning, uh, the, the, I think the general dilemma was 
how to stop contagion without affecting the, the economy so much. So uh, the federal government adopted a specific measure to strengthen the health system to control the disease, for example, reconverting public hospitals, uh, expanding the public uh, network with the inclusion of uh, private hospitals, and importing the essential equipment required to uh, care for patients uh, more effectively. Uh, but uh, at the same time, uh, as I said, economy was a very important concern due mainly to the important size of the informal economy. So for example, 60 percent of people uh, work in the informal economy. So for the government it was very important to uh, care for, for that for that sector. Uh, and then, for example, no mandatory mobility restrictions were formally imposed across the country, mainly because uh, people working in the informal economy, uh, in a sense, um, live uh, day by day, uh, earning uh, income uh, on a daily on a daily basis. Um, and so, uh, I think uh, it's important to mention that even though uh, Mexico, as I said, is, is very centralized uh, in fiscal uh, terms, particularly, uh, the state governments were very active uh, in, in dealing with the pandemic. Uh, and since the beginning, uh, it was clear that in a sense, state governments uh, began to compete in a sense with the federal government. Uh, for, so for example, uh, many state governments uh, considered that the federal authority was not acting fast enough, and so they decided to adopt their own measures. Uh, and then, for example, apart from canceling classes, uh, 10 out of the 32 states closed bars, restaurants, museums, and beaches earlier than the date proposed by federal authorities. And in addition to that, all state uh, governments adopted measures restricting work and movement, and um, most of them implemented food support plans. Uh, and also the economic relief uh, programs uh, devised by state governments were very important and range from uh, wage uh, subsidies and cash transfers to uh, de deferral and discount on taxes for both individual and businesses. Uh, in addition, uh, tax I I inspections were, were postponed in uh, many states. Um, but I think the most important lesson uh, from the Mexican case uh, is the lack of coordination between level, uh, levels of, of government. And this was due both to the lack of uh, institutional um, bodies um, able to, uh, in a sense, um, put these two uh, type of authorities uh, together and also to political polarization. Um, so uh, the, the lack of coordination was clear since the beginning, but uh, with time uh, slowly evolved into an open political conflict between uh, federal authorities and several government, uh, governors uh, uh, enrolled in parties in opposition to the president. And uh, this, uh, for example, led to uh, some strange situations. Uh, for example, uh, in July, nine governors signed an open letter asking for the resignation of the, under, uh, for the resignation of the Undersecretary of Health uh, who is the person in charge of the federal government strategies, uh, strategy to, to deal with the, with the crisis. And uh, also some governors accused the federal government to uh, manipulate some uh, data in order to, uh, in a sense, uh, punish uh, them uh, in political terms. Uh, so I think this is the Considering the, 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 the possibility that uh, the, the second wave will hit the country very soon, I think it's important to uh, understand uh, the reasons behind this lack of coordination and to, uh, in a sense, uh, work on this uh, to, to uh, design a broader and more effective response. 
Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Lamea. I appreciate that. Um, I will now go ahead and open the floor for discussion. And we have some questions from the audience. Um, so the first question we have here, it says, in countries or regions where government financial support for people who have lost employment due to COVID has been adopted, was it a federal government responsibility policy or a subnational one? Well, I mean, in, in the case of Mexico, we have never had like a strong unemployment benefit uh, program. Um, so uh, when when the pandemic uh, hit the country, uh, the government didn't implement an aggressive uh, policy on, on that area. Um, the federal government um, implemented some programs uh, targeted to uh, support, uh, especially small companies, uh, with um, with loans. And uh, some loans were also uh, focused on the informal sector of the economy. And uh, in a sense, the the subnational governments did more or less the same. Uh, and so, uh, in, in 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 most cases, we we had uh, programs uh, also at the subnational level um, focused on small companies and uh, aim to give them some, uh, I would say, temporary support, uh, especially in terms of uh, subsidies and, and loans. Uh, but I would say, but. I, uh, no um, big um, initiative was uh, focused on uh, uh, unemployment. Thank you, Dr. Omea. Um, another member of the audience is actually asking, due to the financial debts generated by the pandemic, not evenly distributed among fe federal and subnational governments, can we foresee institutional changes to be adopted to address this imbalance? Uh, Dr. Omea? Yes, uh, just to mention that uh, in the case of Mexico, before the, the, the COVID crisis, the federal government had been trying to address some of these uh, inequalities, but uh, mainly through big uh, federal projects, infrastructure projects, I mean, and, and social programs uh, target uh, particularly to the states in the south of the country that are the poorest. Uh, in the context of, of the crisis, however, and paradoxically, uh, the states that uh, put the, 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 the issue uh, in the agenda, demanding a revision uh, of the fiscal pact, uh, had been the states, uh, the, the richer states, uh, the states in the north, uh, arguing that uh, most of the GDP uh, is generated in, in those uh, states and they don't receive enough money uh, in terms of uh, federal transfers. Um, but I mean, in this case, I, I think it's not um, just a technical discussion, but it's mo mostly a political discussion because most of these states are governed by uh, governors and role in the, in the opposition. So, uh, I think um, in the case of Mexico nowadays, it's difficult to uh, separate uh, technical discussions from uh, political uh, or, or for, for, for uh, separating them from, from the general context of political uh, polarization uh, experienced by, by the country. Thank you, Dr. Romero. Uh, we'll move to uh, the next one. Okay, somebody here is also asking. I am interested in hearing perspectives on the constitutionality of restricting travel across subnational borders, particularly when it is the initiative of subnational governments themselves. Yeah, go ahead, Dr. Omer. Well, I mean, in, in the case of Mexico, um, some national governments uh, didn't uh, implement, uh, I mean, uh, strict restri restrictions to, to enter the, their territories. Uh, but in some cases, uh, for example, some states demanded that uh, flights uh, were canceled. Uh, that, that's a, an attribution uh, responsibility of the federal government. And so uh, the federal government did, didn't comply with, with that demand. Um, so uh, I think, uh, I mean, uh, of course, it's, it's not uh, permitted in, in the constitution. And we didn't face uh, particular situations where conflict arise uh, in, in relation to, to that uh, 
to that issue uh, as uh, was the case in, in other uh, countries in the region. Thank you very much, Dr. Lamea.